Cool. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name's Chris, uh, Chris Woodfield from the Low Carbon Devon Project. Really excited to welcome you on this beautiful afternoon uh, to inspire ambition system shift low carbon Devon series of events uh, do come in make yourself comfortable it'd be great to see some faces if you're able to keep your cameras on that'd be awesome um, so yeah really excited to welcome you this event is part of low carbon Devon's system shift inspire ambition series of events uh, but it's also tied in with something happening here in Plymouth called the Plymouth Social Enterprise Networks Festival. Um, and the theme this year is on the Sustainable Development Goals. And that's the theme of this event as well. So we're really keen to sort of tie that in um, with what's happening. So really excited to sort of welcome you. And we've got an um, action-packed event coming up. Uh, we've got uh, four speakers who are going to share share a bit about what they're up to um, and how that sort of links in with the, with the SDGs, with the Sustainable Development Goals. And then we've got plenty of time for a discussion as well and a sort of Q&A. Um, so do think of some questions as our speakers are sharing, sharing their story and sharing what, what they're up to. I'm just going to set the scene and, and then we're going to say hello to, to the speakers and then we'll, we'll sort of dive straight in. So if you don't know um, anything about, in the, about us, and this is your first time at one of our events, as I said, my name's Chris, Chris Woodfield, and I work on the Low Carbon Devon Project, which is based here at the University in Plymouth. Um, and it's all around supporting, empowering and facilitating action around climate change and around the low carbon agenda in Devon. Um, so really excited to be working on the project. We, we're based in something called the Sustainable Earth Institute and also the Centre for Sustainable Futures um, here at the university. And my role is to, to support and liaise with local businesses and figure out sort of how we can work together, collaborate, and really sort of, as the name of this event suggests, try and inspire action, inspire ambition, but try and put in to action practical solutions and really, it's not just about talking about change, but really about trying to catalyze that action and really excited at the moment with the sort of wave of movement uh, moving in the right direction. Um, so that's just a tiny bit about us. But, but if you want to know more, um, really keen to follow up conversations um, moving on after this event. But, but for now, this is, this is System Shift, Inspire Ambition and focusing on the sustainable development goals. So I'd love to just bring our speakers on to the virtual stage, just so we can sort of say hello to them briefly uh, before they sort of dive in to our presentations. So we've got four speakers lined up. Um, and I just wanted to just check in and just say hello if, if everyone was up for just maybe just saying who you are, where you are sort of 30 second check-in and also maybe just something something that's inspiring you at the moment or something that's inspiring you about autumn or your favorite thing about autumn um, yeah maybe we could start with with uh, Emma thanks Chris um, so I'm Emma Burlow um, I'm based up in Gloucestershire the beautiful forest of Dean so um, it's an amazing time to live near a great forest um, so I'll come on to what I do. I work with businesses on sustainability um, and have done for, for my whole career. So it's something that I've, um, I've done ever since I left school. Um, but what's inspiring me is actually before I came on this call, I bumped into someone in the village and they started talking about climate change. And I, I left that conversation with a real spring in my step because that wouldn't have happened a year ago. Um, and um, I think that's a real shift. Awesome, cool. Thanks, Emma. So we'll be hearing more from Emma shortly. Um, yeah, Charlie, how about you? Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Charlie Brunyates. Uh, I'm based down in Torquay in, in South Devon. Uh, and I am a well, co-founder of uh, Mineral Digital. 
Uh, we were a marketing sustainability agency, um, qualified in digital marketing, um, and qualified sustainability consultants, uh, and PR and comms to drive sort of purpose-led value in the region and beyond. Um, and I think with everything that's been going on in the past 18 months and, and having just come through COP, um, something that's sort of really inspiring me at the moment is everyone's uh, interest and uh, knowledge that's sort of really growing and, and kicking off with regards to our environment, regional produce, uh, seasonality, um, and sort of heading in towards the Christmas period. Everyone's putting real consideration into sort of purposeful gifts, um, you know, sustainable items and things like that. So it's really nice that the general public have this appreciation of nature and our environment once again. Nice work. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, cool. How about um, Rosamond? How are you? Hi, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I'm doing well and it's really wonderful um, to join everyone. And um, I'm joining uh, you all from the top of the Western Highlands, up near the Isle of Skye. So uh, one of my inspirations today, I was just um, telling everyone before we started, uh, was heading out the door and having my usual constitutional walk um, and finally seeing the first um, big flurry of snow on top of the mountains. So it's definitely feeling, uh, feeling wintry. Um, so my background is as a secondary school teacher um, and I actually started a social enterprise in Plymouth uh, a wee while ago so Gareth is familiar with me. Hi Gareth, lovely to see you. Um, where I uh, worked as a consultant um, and support for secondary schools in developing learning for sustainability in their campus and curriculum. Um, I also did uh, a lot of work in developing uh, networks of learning for sustainability and um, lectured at the University of Plymouth. Um, and since moving to Scotland, um, I've started my PhD now. So my big passion is alternatives in education and really exploring different ways of learning together um, in the outdoors uh, through alternative kind of methods and approaches that enable us to collaborate better on finding the solutions we need uh, to mitigate uh, climate change and bio biodiversity loss and just find better ways of living democratically together. So that's me. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And yeah, Tom, brief intro from yourself. Hi everyone. Uh, apologies, I've got really bad signal and everyone's extremely laggy. So I'll, uh, I'll turn my video off in the hope that that fixes it. Um, we're based in Devon in Torquay. Um, we're currently moving offices, hence the really bad internet. I'm hot spotting off a colleague's phone <laughs> because that's the best we've got at the moment. Um, so uh, bear with me during the main presentation. I'll probably ask everyone to turn their cameras off. Um, but yeah, so I'm a co-founder of Art Marine. Um, we're an eco-engineering company specializing in nature-based solutions. Uh, specifically focusing on offshore energy structures and coastal defence projects, um, trying to green the grey infrastructure that's often used by coastal engineers. Um, I think what's really great about um, this all at the moment is uh, COVID seems to be in the rearview mirror, touch wood, um, and the whole uh, building back in the green seems to be at the forefront of people's minds. So we're hoping that that's not just rhetoric uh, and going into 2022. That's actually something that's realised through projects like ours and um, some of the participants on this panel. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, nice little overview. And yeah, thanks for that. You, you came through fine then. So that's good to hear. Um, awesome. So I think we'll flow straight into to our first um, speaker, which is which is going to be Emma. We'll let Emma tell you a bit more about herself and what she's, what she's up to. So Emma, over over to you. Okay, I am sharing. Can you see that, guys? We just put it on presentation mode. Yeah, that's all good. Great. I've got to get my video pe people out of the way. Okay, so um, thanks very much, Chris. So I'm Emma. Um, I work with businesses on sustainability issues. So I've got a background in environmental science and conservation at uni. And then I realized that um, the heart of the problem was coming from industry and, and business. So I decided to, um, to work in that field. Um, so I, I, I help companies 
take um, steps basically to sort of address and uh, set and achieve their sustainability goals in, in the sort of broadest sense. So we're talking about action today. Um, and the thing that I find um, both interesting and frustrating about action is people always talk about say, you must act today, you must act today. Uh, but then today becomes tomorrow and it's like going on diet is that you never quite get around to it and you don't if you, even if you did you wouldn't quite know where to start um so I, I sometimes say to people well what if you had to take an action now I'm not going to let you out of the room until you decide what it is people say well I just you know I don't know where to start it's a really confusing topic so a lot of the work I do is about um uh translating that confusion if you like into action particularly for boards and senior managers of businesses, but also for, um, you know, suppliers to, to big companies and um, local authorities and, and all sorts of other, other people, anyone who's kind of wrestling with this conundrum, really. So I do a lot of work building bridges, and I think that's really important. We've got a really strong community action, and we've got sort of global concern about what's happening, and then we've got a massive gulf between that and what's happening in industry and business, and then kind of another big gulf between what's happening in governments and policy. Um, and so um, I try to sit in both camps sometimes and sort of say, well, how, how can we see it from someone else's point of view? You know, if you're in a business that's heavily sales driven and all the, everyone in that business's targets are based around sales, it's very difficult for them to suddenly drop all that and say, oh, you know, we're suddenly going to set net zero targets and we're going to change the way we work overnight so I have to try and work with them to say but how do you integrate sustainability into what you already do because those sales targets may, may well still be there for the next year two years five years ten years um, who knows until until the business can change its trajectory so I talk about the value action gap which is something that happens in public life as well because you sort of see or hear people say things that what they think they don't often do so it's interesting in one of the introductions people are starting to say they want to shop locally but then we'll all shop on amazon you know and, and i'm guilty of that too so it's trying to say you know take actual steps rather than talking about the steps that you'd like to take um, and that gets a sort of snowball effect going that i find anyway um, when I talk more broadly, and I'm, the reason I'm covering this today is because I know lots of you might have interface with businesses or have businesses that come to events. I try and talk about um, avoiding that, um, uh, what's the word, a sort of delay and that, that paralysis people get when they don't know what to do. So I try and say, you know, we need to look at strategy, but to, do, to build that strategy, you need some knowledge because otherwise you get stuck because you don't know how to write the strategy. Um, and then once you've got those two things, you can think about implementation. It will come a lot easier once you've upskilled and you've got a strategy. What most businesses do is they start with implementation and they say, right, we're going to offset our carbon and we're going to change our packaging. And they go straight for implementation. Now, that can have some immediate short term gains, but it can quite often have quite a lot of unintended consequences, too. And so that's really why we see this kind of zigzagging and knee jerk. Um, behavior because people aren't really yet approaching this topic strategically so that's what I try and do with them sort of get them to sit back and say where's the gap in your knowledge what now you know that now you've got that information you can set you can set a clearer strategy so how does this relate to SDGs so the, the main SDGs that I work around are 12 and 13 uh, responsible consumption production and climate um, but actually, as you all all know, if you've looked at the SDGs, um, almost every act activity we take, if we take it in a sustainable way, i.e. we have, you know, cause and concern for, for the wider environment, we're having an effect on lots and lots of, of, of the SDGs. So I do that by working with uh, topics like circular economy. Um, so that's looking at the flow of materials and keeping those value materials at high value for as long as possible but also through Net Zero and through B Corp, which I know you've had a seminar on before, Chris, it's a really good way of pulling a lot of these things together. So just gonna to touch on SDG 12, um, which um, is mainly where I work. Um, I work with a lot of companies around transitioning to, to circular business models. 
And one of the things I love to do is to kind of normalize this and to make it, um, to, to draw attention to what's in the mainstream. So I run this series called CE100 on LinkedIn and, and uh, Instagram actually. And what I do is I profile companies all in the UK, all that are mainstream, so they're not niche and random and you can't get hold of their product. Um, all that um, have a circular business model of some kind, and then that's part of what they do. So this is Zipyard, they're a franchise where you can take your clothes to get them uh, repaired or issues or whatever. But there are others like Timpsons and Rug Doctor and Co-Cars and, and loads and loads of different circular business models. So all of these activities that you might see, hire, reuse, refill, um, leasing, refurbishment, remanufacture, all the way through to recycling. And I put that at the end intentionally. So all of those models are opportunities for businesses at the moment under SDG 12 to say, how do we transition to a more circular business? You know, how do we use less raw materials? How do we sell a service um, rather than a product? How do we get our product back? How do we sell it three times rather than once? You know, they're all massive opportunities. So it's not just about how do we um, be more efficient, you know, it's actually about how do we change our whole business model really. So I love doing that work because that's full of opportunity and growth markets and businesses love all that stuff. And so my final word really is really about if you are working either from a general public point of view or from within a business, um, collaboration is absolutely key. So that whole part about knowledge, is your knowledge is re can be really, really speeded up by collaborating with others in your field or in your local area and events like this, but also, you know, looking at your peers, what your competitors are doing, that sort of stuff. And if you can join forces with your supply chain or even your competitors or your industry body, we can move ahead. And we're seeing this with net zero now where whole industries are, are aligning and, and moving much more quickly. So that, that's me, feel free to, to get in, you know, in touch online um, and hopefully you'll have some questions that we can cover in the Q&A. Thanks very much, Chris. Awesome, thanks, Emma. Really lovely overview. Um, and thank you for that little quote as well at the end. It reminds me of that um, the one I'm sure you've heard of, which I think is, yeah, if you wanna go fast, go alone. Or if you want to go far, go together. Um, and talking about that aspect of collaboration. So awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll come to Emma at the end for questions. So if you do have questions for Emma, make a note of them now or, or pop them in the chat and we can and we can explore those together in the QA at the end. But I think we'll we'll flow straight on um, to our next speaker, who is going to be Tom, uh, Tom Be Burbeck from Arc Marine. And as Tom mentioned, he's he's struggling with a bit of his internet connection. So hopefully Tom is there. But if we might be able to turn our videos off just for Tom's bit, it might help his connection. So Tom, are you there? Let me just check. <laughs> if he's dropped out, we can go straight on and come back to him. I think he literally just dropped out as you announced his name. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let's have a look. Yeah, I don't think he's there, is he? Signals just dropped, Chris. Cool. Well, let's go straight on to um, Rosamond, if that's okay. Um, if you're if you're up for that, and let's yeah. put the cameras back on <laughs> and and see if Tom joins us. Are you happy to to go for it? Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks, Chris. Oh, that's a shame. <clears throat> but hopefully he'll get back in and still be able to present. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so my um, area that I'm going to be um, talking about is obviously quality education, SDG number four. Um, and it's a massive passion of mine, um, as I explained in my little intro. Um, and as I talk, um, I'm going to just share a little bit about uh, one project that I, I worked with Chris on and co old colleagues at the University of Plymouth. Um, 
And then I'm also going to mention a few other case studies as really interesting um, approaches to alternative um, models of, of learning that uh, could be explored um, for educational futures and how we find um, creative, innovative, um, hopeful um, ways of, of finding solutions for, for some of those big, wicked, complex um, problems that, that we're facing. Um, so Chris has very kindly offered just to post a few links, as I sort of mentioned some of those projects. So feel free to um, click on those, look at them later, um, or kind of uh, copy and paste them off and, and take a look in your own time. The first thing I wanted to highlight was actually how much has been achieved globally in, in meeting the SDG. Um, for quality education. Um, it has been um, a massive achievement by the United Nations and collaboration around the world to ensure that uh, every, at least every primary aged child has access to some form of um, educational space um, and as free as possible. And still in a lot of nations um, elsewhere around the world, secondary education um, is still quite challenging to, to access um, for free. Um, so uh, there's some nations where obviously uh, we have infrastructures in place with taxation and, and other things that allow us to access that. Um, and I just wanna highlight that uh, that achievement is, is significant around the globe, that general literacy um, for nearly every primary age child has, has been achieved, uh, which is something wonderful, along with challenges to, to gender equity as well, making sure that um, both uh, boys and girls have access to that primary education too. I want to then look at something that UNESCO has been um, bringing into the fore, um, which is a new uh, programme of theirs called Learning to Become. And they opened it up for a range of organizations and individuals to contribute to a, a, a pretty substantial consultation process um, where they've had over 400 focus groups. They've had um, over 6,300 uh, participants um, kind of contributing their own ideas and um, uh, supporting um, possibilities around how we might shift um, education, how we might look at different systems of education, different focuses for education. Uh, they did a one minute survey and they had over 100,000 people contribute to that survey. They also opened up a space for art submissions. So people to kind of draw pictures or impressions or share an artistic creation um, or write uh, something about their vision for what the future of education could look like. Um, and then they also had over 55,000 um, social media responses to their inquiry. So using quite an eclectic mosaic of uh, resources, they are putting together essentially a vision from um, all continents of the world as well. Um, not just local. Oh, I've got loads and loads of geese flying past at the moment. Sorry, <laughs> it's quite loud out the window. <laughs> um, and uh, the Learning to Become program is really exploring how we might put these different practices in in place. Um, so is the is the system that we've kind of inherited very much from the industrial revolution um, the system that we want to continue with? Are there different models? Um, are there a lot of place based models that we can explore? Um, do we want to adopt uh, more kind of community outdoor uh, based uh, practices? Uh, what age ranges do we want to be teaching different stages at? What kind of qualifications do we want to do? Do we want to have it as curriculum based or do we want it thematic, project based? Do we want to explore interdisciplinary learning more rather than siloed subject learning? So there's a whole range of really complex questions um, that come in there and a lot of people are exploring what the best combinations might well be in order to better prepare children young people for the future and how they can feel a lot more empowered and potentially hopeful about how they can participate in that future and underpinning all of that is very much this idea of climate justice so we, it needs to be embedded within a sustainability model um, uh, looking at ecosystems but also a social justice model um, and looking at how we make better decisions together in democratized um, spaces uh, different ways of working that enable all voices to be included uh, so those are all the things that uh, they're really exploring in the learning to become uh, UNESCO project uh, so definitely keep an eye out for their their kind of outcomes and, and some of their proposals and there's some really interesting research organizations that uh, are promoting that um, 
And one of the quotes that uh, came out of, uh, which I'll just, I'll say that I've noted down was to collectively reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. So that's their aim for, for that whole, whole project. Um, so I wanted to also share a couple of other case studies. I'm just having a check on time. I've got plenty of time, haven't I? Um, and uh, there's two that I really wanted to share that I've I've come across in the last couple of years, uh, two that are very, very inspirational that I think could provide really useful models to work from. And one of them is called the Morecambe Bay Curriculum. So the Eden Project North is exploring two projects, um, one at Morecambe Bay and the other at uh, Dundee. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Dundee, so I'm really intrigued to see what they're going to be emerging with at Dundee. Uh, but the uh, University of Lancaster in collaboration with Eden Project North have proposed a place-based um, learning curriculum. So primary schools, secondary schools, uh, business partnerships, the local council, uh, lots of other community groups are all exploring and co-designing um, a local place-based curriculum, um, which is intergenerational. So they're looking at it as lifelong learning and it's all nested and embedded within an understanding of the environmental ecosystem that everyone is living in and where the schools are and how we can build projects that interconnect with the local environment, with the local businesses and within the concept of um, improving um, life experience, the quality of life uh, within those areas as well. And it's a very, very interesting um, project. Um, <clears throat> the other example that I wanted to share with you um, is not necessarily um, such a substantial project, but it's, it's essentially a way of working within the classroom. Um, and that is the Compassionate Systems Framework um, for Schools. So um, this emerges out of work to do with complex uh, systems thinking, um, which is um, an element of a lot of um, ecological um, and educational systems thinking. And what they're trying to put into practice through this model is children and young people being able to practice within a classroom space, the experience of, of having compassion for our lived, um, lived experience with um, these challenging circumstances. Um, so it's an awareness of our global interconnectedness um, and our interdependence and how that then affects how we make decisions, you know, being aware of different privileges um, within the world, being aware of different people's lived experiences and the diversity of different um, experiences. It also promotes the awareness of the scale of the global issues. Um, so again, it brings in this um, amalgamating of, of climate justice as, uh, you know, a biodiversity awareness, of climate awareness, as well as social justice uh, being a really uh, important element into it. And it's also an awareness of the historical um, injustices um, that have caused quite um, a lot of the, the current circumstances that we find ourselves in. So it's an awareness of um, colonialism and imperialism. It's awareness of how different economic systems um, are impacting. So it builds in all of those different elements um, and it enables children, young people to explore that complexity, um, often in educational circumstances. Um, because of having to be tied to a very specific curriculum um, and being tied to a very specific specification for an examination, a lot of teachers are constrained without being able to explore these complexities and also the emotional literacy that needs to come from, from exploring this with children, young people. Um, you've got eco-anxiety, you've got climate anxiety, all of those things are very prescient in children, young people's lives, including our own um, as adults and not providing meaningful, compassionate spaces where those things can be explored expressed, I think is going to be detrimental for the next generation. Um, I think I've probably only got what, two or three, two more minutes left, Chris. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so those are the, the, the two case studies I wanted to share as possible options for um, educational futures inspired by the, the UNESCO work. Um, and I also wanted to, to just share a few other models that I've, I've come across, um, if they're of interest um, to you. One is the very new, the London is Interdisciplinary School. Um, I got very excited about this because they've specific, uh, specifically designed themselves as a higher educational um, school um, that 
uh, essentially gives a brief to their students and says this is the problem and they support interdisciplinary thinking across multiple um, different uh, fields and disciplines to come up with a solution for it. So it could be medical, it could be scientific, it might be social, but it's all interconnected to the biodiversity and climate challenges that, that we're facing. So it specifically designed itself to work alongside that. The other ones I wanted to share um, are obviously forest schools and forest kindergartens um, are a beautiful model. Um, to, to explore our relationships with and as nature um, and how those are really important for those early years, um, education, primary education. And I would love to see more of that into secondary school as well. I mean, and all of us as adults, we should go play in the woods too. Um, so I would like to, to leave that there as my um, sharing of, of opportunities for our, for our future and the quality of education. Awesome, thank you. Um, loads of great stuff in there, and I've tried to pop those links in the chat. So, so do do have a look at that, um, or I'll save them for later. And we can also share them afterwards um, as well, as well as the presentations, um, if the speakers are happy. Um, so, thank you again. We'll we'll come we'll come back um, and do a Q and A at the end. Uh, but really interesting. Really keen to discuss more about that. Also. Um, I forgot to mention it. It'd be really great, actually, if people could put who they are in the chat. Um, if that might work, just it'd be great to have a feel of who's in the room. Apologies, I should have done that at the beginning. Um, in terms of yeah, who you are and where where you're from or who you're representing. But for now, I think Tom is is back with us, and we're going to try again. Um, so welcome, Tom from from Art Marine. Over to you, Tom. And it, it might be worth us trying again to put our videos off just to help Tom's bandwidth um, and, and see if we could go from there. It's quite stable now, which is good. Um, uh, if, I, if I do sort of crash out, <laughs> uh, Charlie will take over and, and give a few words to, to carry on where I lost off. Um, but thank you everyone for joining today. Um, uh, it's really exciting to have this sort of platform locally. Um, it's normally uh, on, on bigger stages that these conversations are had and it's local markets that often get forgotten. But um, at Art Marine, we really believe that starting locally is key to sort of starting a trend nationally. Um, so it's, it's really good to see so many people interested and contributing to what we're trying to do um, and, and, how, and cover all the SDG goals because that's, that's really where we need to be at. But um, I'm here to talk, talk about Art Marine who are focused on uh, SDG 14, Life Low Water. And to give you a bit of an intro into Art Marine, uh, we're an eco-engineering company. Um, we were started by a group of concerned divers, um, all locally to the Torbay area, who had witnessed firsthand reef degradation, and uh, which was primarily due to the effects of overfishing and sort of man encroaching onto marine spaces. Um, and we thought initially about just restoring marine habitats for ecotourism purposes. Um, but unfortunately, sort of quickly realised that there wasn't a huge amount of interest for that locally. Um, well, maybe an interest, but not anyone that could afford to pay for it. Um, and local councils, local governments didn't have budgets for reef restoration. So we had to quickly look about um, finding a, a paying customer, someone who could actually restore the marine environment at the same time as doing um, standard, standard construction projects. So quite quickly we came across offshore wind and um, offshore coastal fence projects as that's their primary market for us to, to be able to be involved in um, and since then we've been developing our technology which is sort of um, branched into two different streams one is a, a low carbon to a carbon neutral concrete um, where we completely replace, replace Portland's cement in our mix um, and secondly is our structure which is reef food, which is a a modular cuboid shape, which you can see in this image here, which has got a crab in it. Um, this image is actually taken from Tool Bay. Um, and this can be used for scour protection around offshore wind farms, um, big coastal defence blocks, which you, you often see um, around Plymouth, uh, Cornwall, Bricks and Breakwater, where they'd often use uh, concrete caissons or um, granite blocks. Now, what we're looking to do is green these grey infrastructures. So where you'd normally have um, some of a flat featuring concrete wall or concrete block, um, 
our cubes have got um, several chambers, uh, so several passageways, which lead to a spherical chamber, um, which means that marine life can move in and out of the structure um, and give it some place to, to refuge from predators. Um, what we're seeing is that where we put these cubes, biodiversity seems to improve. Um, and hopefully this could be a biodiversity restoration tool that can be used by the big offshore wind and oil and gas developers when they're building a marine environment. Um, so not only are they building renewable energy structures, but they're also restoring at the same time. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're just trying to find the most effective and most efficient way of doing that. And we think that maybe offshore wind and coastal defence uh, is a way forward. Um, so we've got three live reef projects in Full Bay, um, and that was where we started back in 2015. Um, and we're looking to sort of test uh, three or four hypotheses. One is that uh, reef cubes can boost the catch rate of the native lobster and edible crab. So sort of improving commercial fish stocks for the local fishing community. The second one is that we can uh, improve the juvenile spawning grounds for um, marine life such as fish. Uh, and thirdly, that we can actually improve the biodiversity of the whole for the area. Um, and we're using control sites um, also in Port Bay to prove those facts using techniques like eDNA, so environmental DNA from um, sediment or water samples, um, using uh, catch data from sustainable fishing techniques, and also using um, visual aids such as ROVs or divers, um, as you can see from this bottom picture here. Um, we're also noticing that they are also becoming a bit of a, um, a trap for ghost fishing gear. So whilst it's sort of tumbling around the seabed like a, a weed, like in those Western films, they get caught by our these cubes and they can then be removed by divers. Um, so we've been covered, our work has been covered by the World Economic Forum, um, which was really encouraging because it shows that the, um, the profile is, is gradually increasing for what we're trying to do. Um, the industry has also recognised us and we're, we're finalists in three awards for um, the Offshore Achievement Awards in 2022. Uh, and most recently we were uh, uh, entered into the Solar Impulse Foundation for Innovative Who Could Save the World. So our technology has been recognised as a, a key contributor to a net zero pathway and as well as improving biodiversity as a whole. Um, I think that's probably, I'll leave it as there, if that's okay, just because I'm glad that this hasn't cut out. <laughs> but I'll be around for the question time to um, answer more. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. That's great. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, that held out fine. So that sounds awesome. Um, but yeah, thanks for that overview. And yeah, if you, if you can join us for the questions, we can delve, delve more into that if people have questions. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom, from Arc Marine. So now I'm going to hand over to, to our final speaker, um, which is going to be Charlie. And I'll let Charlie um, introduce himself and tell you about what he's been up to. So over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Chris. Um, bear with me while I just bring my screen up. Um, hopefully you guys can see what I'm trying to show you. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, so yes, as I said in my intro, I am uh, Charlie Brunyate. I'm co-founder um, of Mineral and Director of Sustainability um, for our business. Uh, we are a marketing and sustainability agency uh, based in South Devon. Um, so from, from my aspect, I guess, where the other guys were talking about sort of sustainability and how to embed it within businesses, uh, we're doing sort of the same in terms of helping people understand uh, and engage with sustainability, but also then tell the positive stories that come out of that and sort of put those into words to appeal to people, um, reach their target audiences, uh, and not necessarily sell products, but I hope sort of sell purpose and, you know, drive a performance improvement in terms of people's buy-in, credibility, and, and trust in businesses. Um, as a marketer, we've been um, very responsible for the material consumption over the last few years. So it's now up to us to, to turn that cycle around and be responsible for purposeful marketing uh, and extolling the virtues that businesses have and how to get that message across. So. As I say, we, uh, we're a sustainable marketing agency. We founded in 2020 with my business partner, Joe, uh, who manages the digital side. Uh, and our goal was ostensibly to help businesses recover the green, uh, with a green recovery, sorry, um, and really sort of capitalize on the sustainability um, side of things. As I said, with, uh, with COVID and lockdown, um, COP26 as a real 
ambition in the general public and, and across businesses to to seek out purpose, seek out values, uh, and drive that resilience that they need. So, from a regenerative business um, perspective, we want to help businesses adapt, to evolve, and, and you know face the challenges of the future. Um, so, with that respect, I'll see if I can move on to my next slide, um, which I have managed to do. Um, so, in terms of what we're about, you know, our sort of our sort of modus operandi, if you like, is to influence positive, lasting connections between businesses, their audience, um, and without causing a degrade, uh, any degradation to our planet. So, we we do this with our marketing. Um, we look to generate sort of responsible, purposeful solutions for our clients. Um, and that stems from helping them understand sustainability. Uh, and a lot of the time with businesses, they, they have an inkling as to what it is. Um, it's just we have to reframe that message using sort of frameworks like the SDGs and, and contextualize things in a different manner to, to get people thinking differently, um, helping them to sort of change their behaviors, change their outlook. Um, and change the focus of their business. And as I say, oftentimes it's not a particularly big impact. Um, it's just simply positioning things in a slightly different manner for you know, a different generation, a different audience. Uh, Gen Z think about things more differently. Millennials are more inclined to, to buy something from a, a company that sort of values purpose. So that it's just changing the, uh, the potential, changing the impact that businesses make. Um, so as I say here, you know, we, we have this opportunity to change behaviours, um, influence our leadership across government, uh, government and regionally with our local councils, local business leaders um, uh, and local sort of education facilities uh, and foundations and NGOs and so on. You know, there's a real opportunity to drive change um, and from a local action perspective within Devon and Cornwall and, you know, in the West Country in general. We have an opportunity to really sort of develop self-sufficiency, um, really develop our bioregional economy, so you know, become self-sufficient with regards to our agricultural capabilities, maximising our coastline. Um, you know, we have fishing industry in Brixham that is the second biggest in the country. Uh, we export a load of our fish abroad, so you know there are opportunities to start keeping, changing behaviours to sort of you know eat eat locally, shop locally, as, as we all sort of try and, try and do as it is anyway, um, and support those businesses which are trying to drive change in the area. So that's kind of sort of how we, we try and look at things. Uh, and then obviously on the digital marketing side, there is a big drive for data and digital technology. So it's, it's you know, getting businesses to understand, uh, adapt and evolve to that too, uh, to get those messages online and out to the people that they need to see them. So. As I've sort of highlighted here, is the resilience, regeneration, and recovery side of it, um, uh, and essentially our marketing technique is, you know, it's it's not too heavy. We just want to help people along their journeys, um, realize they can't do everything at once, so walking before they can run, um, and just helping that sort of educational piece. You know, once we have that foundation for uh, sustainability and that understanding. We can really sort of drive the marketing angle to, to get the positivity out there um, and get people understanding and help sort of drive that pervasive sustainability message across. So uh, whilst we are a digital marketing agency um, striving to sort of promote sales and that sort of traditional element, we also want to make sure we're doing it in the correct manner and the right way um, and helping businesses uh, to be sustainable. So fundamentally it's sort of, um, that try and vary to those three things to create a sustainable future. Uh, and hopefully um, impart some wisdom these businesses can take forward to be more resilient uh, and understand aspects like their, uh, like their supply chains um, and the impact of, of those sort of things on, on that. So um, it's quite a, quite a varied process uh, and we like to you know, be able to work with clients and certainly in the Southwest we have clients who are very keen to focus on the environment and things. So from that aspect, it's, uh, it's pretty good fun. Um, I'd say from a business side as well, we, uh, we're also an Invity member of the Goal 13 Impact Platform uh, by Deloitte. Um, and this is essentially a partnership with Deloitte, Dell, uh, the Met Office and a few others to identify um, challenges and opportunities uh, for climate action uh, globally. I think we're probably one of the smallest companies in the world on there. Um, and, you know, it's an opportunity and a platform to provide our opinion as to what the what the challenges and opportunities are 
um, and sort of see how we can we can sort of help to action those. Um, you know, some of those things relate relate to supply chain issues, um, cost of production, um, decision making across businesses is probably one of the most fundamental things in terms of how how business owners um, prioritize their decisions, um, add value where they can. And for us, probably most importantly, the engagement and communication piece around um, future business. So for that purpose, the SDGs, again, are a really good framework for this um, and relevant to this local action piece that we're, we're discussing. Um, I think three of the SDGs that stand out and the other speakers have also related to um, SDG 11 uh, around sort of sustainable communities, and sustainable cities, I think is a really prevalent one for us in the Southwest. We've got a, we're in a great place to live. We're very fortunate to have country and coast on the doorstep. Um, and, you know, we need to, we need to consider things like urban planning and livability within our future business models, you know, with the influx of staycationers in the past year due to international lockdowns. There's been a, you know, a surge in numbers down here, which you know, it creates a strain on the local community. Uh, and I think we need to look a little bit more long term to consider the impact of that and how we retain these staycationers to get them coming back again next year and the year beyond. We can't just have this to be a one off because we're heavily reliant on tourism um, and then the interconnectedness with other industries such as fishing. You know, we've got some very good TV programs at the moment about Devon and Cornwall, um, particularly the fishing. We've sort of gained a few celebrities in the fishing scene. So it's connecting those sort of those two industries, you know. Uh, and again, with Art Marine, with Tom's example, with uh, with the reef cubes and the sort of the underwater stuff that's going on from his perspective, you know, more tourists down here, it creates a new opportunity for dive tourism that brings in more revenue and there's, you know, then stuff for these people to see. So we've got this opportunity to do things like that. Um, from a marketing perspective, again, SDG 12 with responsible consumption it is pretty pertinent with uh, Black Friday kicking off tomorrow. You know, we need to... Um, move to reuse and repair uh, to reiterate Emma's points you know we, we need to question what we need and what we don't need um, and and look for this sort of circularity concept and that you know we need to make do with what we have learn to live within our means uh, and improve the longevity of our products uh, things we buy the services we offer and move to assets like shared economies you know it's a lot more um, sustainable to lease share uh, and sort of really consider actions like that, that in our region, uh, we have an opportunity to do with sort of shared, shared, uh, shared cars, um, you know, those sort of things that you see in the major cities outside of our region that we can really take advantage of and capitalize on down here. Um, and again, particularly with regard to this piece, climate action, um, integrating that into businesses for the longer term. You know, it's uh, our fight or flight mechanism often doesn't respond to climate because in the UK, we're not overly affected. We just assume that with things like weather, we're having a particularly bad weather period or a particularly hot summer. But for regions globally that we might rely on from um, a supplier perspective, um, you know, if we're importing uh, foodstuffs from China, say, as a, as a food business in the region, you know, will more rain or will hotter climates impact the supply chain? decrease their yields and subsequently increase our costs. Um, you know, that, that sort of holistic picture of ingratiating climate risk within our business models needs to really be considered. Um, and it's something, you know, we like to help people understand and sort of get their heads around from that aspect. And I guess then it goes back to the, the fight or flight perspective, as I mentioned, in that, you know, we need to be aware that what we can't see will still have an impact on us. And the sooner we embrace those sort of decisions um, from the bigger picture trends, we uh, the sooner we're going to actually stand to be more resilient um, and be able to actually sort of respond to them and not be as impacted. So there's a lot to consider. Um, but ultimately, you know, we have an opportunity to live within our means down here. We need to capitalise on stuff like uh, the regenerative agriculture that is going on within our region and people might not necessarily know about. So again, from our point of view, being able to be involved in the communication side of that is a, is a real bonus for us and helps sort of sell the successes that are going on down here, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to be involved in this today is to help people sort of realize that there are companies like ours down here that want to sell the success of our region, um, help the businesses within our region become more successful and, and more resilient. Um, 
and also you know more collaborative you know we talk of competitive advantage uh, and those sort of elements from our side um but from a marketing angle um you know we want to help support net zero uh, and you know, drive the root cause of problems which is that understanding and education so we need to help sort of boost the private public collaboration um, help people realize that collaboration is better than competition um, across our region you know i like to sort of use karma as an example what benefits one business one day would also benefit another the next day if everyone works together for a bigger the bigger picture and the bigger agenda so i think from that aspect uh, you know that sort of those two key takeaways would be the uh, living within our means uh, improving collaboration across our region for the betterment of everyone um, and that's, as I say, something that we like to help with from a sustainable marketing perspective. Um, you can see sort of more of my witterings on our website at the bottom there. But, you know, I just think this is a really good opportunity for our region to, to drive a resilient pathway to the future. Um, and as I say, with COP26 this past year, it's been a really good opportunity for the public to embrace sustainability uh, and people like ourselves collectively to really drive home what that means and how we can all help. So. I hope that continues. Awesome, thank you, Charlie. Um, thanks for that overview. Really lovely to see the iceberg model there as well and some great stuff in your slides. Um, would really love to, to bring, if we can bring the other speakers back on and we've got time for for questions or Q&A and discussion. So if you do have any questions, do put them in the chat um, and we can sort of go from there. Um, I can kick us off with a question, um, which I'd love to, to build on sort of what Charlie was saying there, but just bring in everyone else as well and, and just kick us off by asking, you know, do you think um, the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals like, are they actually a, they're known as like a, a blueprint um, or a sort of a social foundation and an ecological ceiling it's a, these holistic global goals do you think they they really are a useful framework for for your work and like if so how or, or why and we'd really love to just pick up on on that um maybe emma could you speak to that what do you think yeah sure um Interestingly, I would say only in the last couple of years. So as the SGG framework was adopted by some businesses, but mainly those that would be involved in global activity. So they would have, you know, operations in countries where the SDGs were probably more prominent or the issues were more prominent. But in the UK, it's only been in the last, I'd say, three to five years. You, you sort of hear about them in public forum and local government and you know, regional, um, but I, I do think they're really useful and I'll, and I'll tell you why, because it, it, did, it only dawned on me when I was doing some work on SDGs for a client, um, that it's the first time that, that, that so many people have agreed on a single framework. So I think businesses think there are loads of these frameworks and we kind of pick and choose. And when you tell them like, no, there's one framework, and everyone's agreed that this is the one we're using because they're so used to seeing awards and then you could get this campaign and then, and then there's, there's this framework for this and there's something else for that. They, they kind of think it's optional. And then when you say, no, it's not optional, like everyone's agreed, this is what we're going to do. They're a bit like, oh, why did I not know about this? You know, so I think it is really useful in the same way as, as um you know, the Paris Agreement is really useful. People don't think it's useful, but it is because it's so solid and it's such a foundation. Um, and then when you get businesses to say, well, which ones of these are we working to? They've suddenly got something to latch onto and they feel somehow loosely connected to this like UN global movement, which is amazing, which they couldn't do otherwise. So yeah, it, it's, um, you know, the businesses I work with, it's dawned on them a bit later than I would have liked, but you know, Right, it's uh, really good, really useful. Yeah, cool, thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, Charlie, what about yourself? Yeah, this is, um, yeah, it's a really good one. Again, from my marketing perspective, with my marketing hat on, 
um, it's a really good framework to unite businesses behind because it's quite simplistic. A lot of the um, regulatory frameworks for sustainability are very sort of tech and jargon heavy, and it's still very new. And with things like the science back targets, everyone's still a little unsure. So the, the SDGs are a really good pervasive global framework that people can you know get behind it's quite it's laid out well on the website you know it, it's quite simple in terms of latching onto one as emma said that matters to your business um, and in terms of building business and sort of building a customer base connecting with other other businesses and, and you know all that sort of stuff it's a really good talking point because it doesn't matter whether your businesses are in completely different industries if you both have a, a a goal or a value around say a particular SDG there's a talking point straight away so you can have that commonality and, and those discussions and share ideas and you know um, I always believe that you learn more from other industries and take that knowledge on so it's a really good opportunity for businesses to learn other stuff around that sort of shared value so yeah it's, it's a really good framework and it's one that we use um, as our sort of basis framework or foundation framework if you like for that exact reason yeah awesome um and oh i'll come back to you in a minute about the the platform that you mentioned but um yeah ross what about you i'd be keen to hear your thoughts as well yeah no i really want to echo what charlie and emma were um saying about it it's essentially become a very kind of universal umbrella that is really really useful for everyone to have um an understanding that this is something that everybody is now part of a movement of of working towards and and wanting to achieve the sdgs in response to to the the big challenges that we're facing um i've one of the reasons why i ended up doing the unesco um learning for the future project was um through catalyst 2030 which is um, a big global network of organizations um who are social enterprises and um kind of run by social entrepreneurs who are all working essentially towards one element of the sdgs and um i I found it fascinating how that collaborative energy and like you were saying Charlie being able to work off each other being able to share those ideas is really generative um, and it's enabling a lot of kind of creative emergence um, for you know interesting new businesses circular economy and um, supporting social enterprises and entrepreneurs to kind of come up with these businesses that fill gaps that are really needed um, within uh, local communities and, and local businesses and finding alternative models and I think there's a very creative space around people working um, towards the SDGs. Um, I think in an educational way, <clears throat> for me, it's it's a slightly kind of troubling complex <laughs> because when you're talking about um, education as a, a system for kind of children, and young people, um, and not necessarily kind of education in, in other settings, um, to you can teach the SDGs as they're kind of singular entities under this umbrella that it's all working towards an overall goal um, but I think it's always really really important to exemplify how interdependent they all are as, as, as single aims as well and the relationship and there's some really interesting activities you can do around that within ed educational settings um, and I think it's really difficult to come up with a different model. <laughs> so I think it essentially really, really works um, as something that everyone can work towards. Yeah. And I mean, they're colorful as well, aren't they? They're not like a boring spreadsheet. They're actually vibrant and that's what we need, I think. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really important point around you know, that, what you just touched upon there around, um, you know, they are an interconnected web. I think there could be a critique that you could just look at one or two individually and maybe that's maybe create silos or not this systems approach that we need. Um, so that could be one critique, which maybe we could come back to. But I think, yeah, it's really important isn't it, to view them, to take hold of some, maybe to take ownership of some that, that you are working on, but also realize that they are this interconnected web Um of the 17 global goals and you know the partnership for the goals being goal 17 um really hopefully will we'll emphasize that um would love to pick up on a question from from gareth um in in the chat so gareth Hart 
from the Plymouth Social Enterprise Network and Iridescent Ideas here in Plymouth. Um, he's put a question in which is for to all the panellists, which um, is, do you think COP was all blah, blah, blah? Or are you optimistic um, about what's happened and, and about what's to come? Anyone would like to jump in? I think it's a um, it's a difficult one, Gareth. Um, you know, there's a lot of positives. You know, the fact that we managed to get COP to go ahead in the first place, given the amount of people arriving from around the world and the situation we were in, is um, regardless of the responsibility aspect that people think about it. It was a great event with a load of really good leaders um, from delegates from around the world. So to get everyone in one place that had the means to make the decisions to make this stuff happen was great. Some of the decisions that came out of it around, you know, um, decarbonisation and stuff like that were brilliant. Um, you know, we made some real positive progress. Ultimately, it's not as uh, it's not as uh, complete or as you know concise. And you know, we haven't gone far enough basically with the decisions made at COP. Um, you know, we need to do, be a lot more positive. We need to take a lot more action to keep temperatures to 1.5 degrees. I think we're currently on track for sort of around 1.7 to 2.4, depending on how well we do and how much we deliver on these commitments we've made. Um, the watering down of the agreements in terms of our language from the likes of India and China is disappointing, but you know they're they're a huge growing economies and, and that's what they do. So it's a difficult one to answer, sort of you know contextually to to choose the right answer. But ultimately, we made some good progress. I think more importantly, it's whatever has been committed to, we need to see it follow through and hold the people that have made those decisions to account because they've made those decisions on our behalf. Um, so from that aspect, you know, it's up to us collectively um, across the board um, beyond this call as well with everyone we know to sort of really push home that we need to hold people to account for decisions and commitments that have been made. And I think that's the biggest takeaway. Um, we all have our own views of COP and, and things like that. But yeah, I think fundamentally the, the biggest thing is to make sure everyone is accountable. Yeah. And do you think you, what about you personally? Are you, are you optimistic? Um, yeah, I'm slightly more on that, that the optimistic side of the fence. Um, you know, having, having the knowledge that I have on the sustainability and sort of the, the issues around climate risk and stuff, and a good network of people who have uh, more knowledge than I do, you know, I've got sort of quite a lot of information and there's, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of different opinions. So it's quite difficult to you know, decide what is right. But fundamentally, I think from our perspective and again, with our local action, we need to take the decisions that have been made at COP, take those commitments and, and try and make them work regionally. So, you know, try and follow them through and get local government, local businesses to unite and commit to trying to make them work for us. Um, and I think that's probably the most we can do as individuals. Um, and yeah, I suppose from my perspective, running a sustainable marketing agency, it's, it's advocating for that to happen um, and being on panels like this to help sort of facilitate uh, and, and do my best to make it uh, come across as simply as possible so that we can latch on to stuff and try and drive it through. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, Ro Rosamond, what about you? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Charlie. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. We can't underestimate the power of what what could come out of that. I think there's a lot of potential held um, on a personal level. I don't think it went far enough, uh, just as what Charlie uh, was saying. I want to echo that too. Um, but the fact that everyone did arrive, that the diplomacy occurred, that the agreements emerged, um, that there is a very different atmosphere at this COP. I think coming, um, coming through a global pandemic um, and the very raised profile of climate change and climate justice, just generally in the public narrative, um, I think there is more potential in, in the grassroots movements really functioning much more strongly alongside the, the potential of, of leaders and delegates 
really upholding the the deal that they've made um and yeah i agree with with charlie being able to hold those people in positions of power accountable is really really important as we move forward to make sure that we do meet um the agreements i attended on the saturday and was part of the cop 26 uh, coalition march and speeches down at the the green in uh, glasgow um, and it was very, very profound to be um, part of part of that journey through the streets of Glasgow and hearing the speeches of all the Indigenous leaders that um, had, you know, all this donated money to be able to get them there, to get them to be able to speak in, in their own languages, um, to be able to hear from kind of grassroots land workers alliances to hear from um, a lot of feminist movements a lot of anti-racism movements a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, decolonizing uh, movements as well um, you know really looking at that complexity of how all of those different um, movements are really trying to collaborate on on multiple levels and that gets really uh, difficult I think there is no simple solutions a lot of the time for all of this um, and I thought that that was um, a very, very uh, positive presence um, within the streets of Glasgow. And I would have really have liked to have seen that same presence um, within the, the blue zone um, during discussions and, and conversations um, to have kind of bridged um, those worlds, you know, the grassroots um, indigenous ways of being and their knowledges um, really um, influencing a lot of um, the, the leadership uh, and delegates there. Um, but that that could come, you never know. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that insight. And, and really lovely to hear that, that you were there and, and your experiences. Um, yeah, Emma, what about you? What are your feelings coming from that? Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed listening to that, Rosamond. Um, yeah, I'll just echo, I suppose. And what can, you know, what can you say? We've all have high hopes. I'm an optimist. And I think partly I'm an optimist because I started doing this in the 90s. So those of you who are old enough to remember acid rain and save the whales, that's basically where I started. So climate change was, you know, only scientists knew about it. And there was, when I did my degree, there was two or three unis even teaching it. So, you know, I, I know it's only, uh, you know, 25 years, but I just can't believe the change. Um, and so do I think it's blah, 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 y you know, yes, but there's a hell of a lot more people listening to that blah, blah, blah than there was even at the last COP. I mean, no one even knows about the last COP, right? Some people know about Paris Agreement, but hardly anybody on the planet. Really. Um, but, you know, to have my kids talking about it, to have, like, say, someone in the village, my mum and dad watching it on the news. I mean, I was absolutely gobsmacked to have a conversation with them about it and they were like oh isn't this what you do you know <laughs> like last 20 years has just gone over their head but because it's on daytime telly and all that stuff so I just think we've never had that in living history in certainly not in the UK so we've got to be kind of grateful for that it wasn't shoved away behind closed doors I know the blue zone was but in terms of the media a lot of media coverage I think what we've got to do now is we've really got to keep that momentum. My fear is that it all just kind of goes off into the, you know, into the ether and there's like another crisis. So I'm working really hard on businesses with things like carbon literacy to sort of back up that initial awareness with some actual understanding. Because actually there is a, there is a huge amount of misinformation and misunderstanding and kind of, is this really urgent? And I heard it was all about volcanoes anyway. And, you know, aren't we getting closer to the sun? I mean, it's just, I know we laugh, but there's so much of it. You've only got to look at Facebook. <laughs> um, and these are just like general conversations that people are having. So I really hope that we don't leave it all to the kids. And whilst it's, we need to educate them. Yeah, they're great. My kids are all over it. They're just like, you know, what's so difficult to work out? I actually think the education needs to come it, you know in in the middle generations it, you know, in my generation and you know 25 and 30 year olds who are going to be the biggest consumers you know buying the most stuff and making big decisions um you know or anyone who's got a bank account basically um so yeah that i'm i'm really optimistic i just i just feel under a bit of pressure to keep the um momentum going that's it
Yeah. Great, thank you. And and we can all, um, if you haven't already, you know, we can all change our banks to a more sustainable bank. Um, yeah, I did that. Our that. pensions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's, there's Shreedos Bank in, in, in the UK. It's a really easy, simple thing to do. So, you know, if people want to do one thing around their sustainable finances, you know, they're a B Corp and it's a simple thing to do. But can, yeah, can, yeah, can try and shop with B Corps. That's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I um, would love to pick up on what you mentioned around carbon literacy, because um, that's something we've been exploring here through Low Carbon Devon, and I'm really keen to sort of mm. work with local businesses or maybe yourself around like yeah, yeah, rolling, rolling out that for businesses, employees, and, and the role of you know employees, um, staff members within businesses, and how they they could be at the forefront of change. Um, yeah it's really important to me so just like Rosman's you know passion is education my passion is you know awareness of, of the business world really and that is education in another way um, and so um, I got involved with the carbon literacy project I did my training in March and then now I've trained as a trainer and just had a course accredited so I wrote a I sort of adapted their course which is aimed at um, everybody general public anyone and I just adapted it to business audience so again that's anyone in the business but basically anyone is employed so the reason being is you you um you might think about your personal footprint in terms of your home and whether you're your diet and whether you've got you know renewable energy or whatever but if you work in a business you might not have control over the energy um you know or whatever so you have to think about it differently um and also you know businesses need to know about what does net zero mean whereas you wouldn't think that as a householder so it's explaining those things um, as well as the climate science and the data um, really to, to give people the confidence to have those conversations at work. Um, so, you know, everyone's hopefully got someone at work who wants to take this on, but they don't always have the groundswell of everybody else. So sometimes they feel like, you know, oh, I'm the green champion. I'm always, you know, I'm always the one who sets up the recycling. I'm always the one who's saying, do we really have to have that heating on? If you can upskill everyone else, I mean, it's just the momentum. I've seen it. Just things just happen. People just, I usually say I never really thought about it. Or they say, I didn't realise it was that bad. Um, or they say, I didn't feel confident enough to bring it up. That, that's really common in the people that I've trained. So a lot of it is about giving people the confidence. Um, they call it the literacy. So you're able to understand it and talk about it so yeah it's really exciting so happy to talk to you a bit about you know how we can run one for your businesses or yeah whatever. That'd be, yeah. yeah that'd be great and um i think you know it's a huge huge potential there and um i also want to pick up on something um charlie mentioned which sort of links in around um regeneration and a sort of how we need to be regenerative businesses. And um, I don't know if you, you use those words deliberately, Charlie, but for me, I've been thinking over the past couple of years that, you know, sustainability is not enough and we need to be regenerative and regenerative businesses and talk about it in that way. Um, but maybe that's too much of a leap for people. I don't know. Maybe it's just, there's a journey there from being a sustainable business to a regenerative one. I was just curious, Charlie, why, why you use that phrase, regenerative business and whether that's something that you deliberately chose instead of sustainable business um, yeah yeah it was a deliberate choice um you know sustainability as a term um is becoming quite ubiquitous and with it you know it's, it can lose a little meaning because it covers so many different things so um for us regenerative business is, is kind of that circularity sort of vibe looking at things uh long term you know if you're creating a new product, it's it's thinking, well, let's map out the whole value chain. So your suppliers, producers, manufacturers, through to your your st other stakeholders, your customers, um, you know, really finding out what their wants and needs are, so that you can produce something that's as efficient uh, and economical as possible. Think about what you're going to do at the end of that product's life, how it can be reused. Um, you know, 
re repurposed into something else or recycled, you know, taking those materials out. You think, uh, take an example of the iPhone, you know, the, there's sort of 17 or so rare earth metals within that. Um, and I'm sure we've all probably got a couple sat in our drawers at home somewhere, but you know, we can, we can return those and have the materials stripped out and reused. The actual innards, um, you know, they can be regenerated and recycled quite a few times before they lose their, lose their capability. So it's, it's, it's getting everyone to think a little bit more holistically about the bigger picture. Um, and this is where, again, why I mentioned sort of the shared economies, uh, and again, as Emma has as well, uh, getting people to sort of think about, well, instead of buying something, maybe I can rent it or lease it and hand it back so that the, the product at the end of its life or the end of its term can be returned and repurposed into something else. So, you know, it, it's more terminology and, and reframing the messaging and getting people to think about something in a slightly different way. Um, and for us as you know, a marketing agency, don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole with people about it because people we speak to have you know, different needs, different requirements, different levels of understanding. It's just getting the right level of information for that person or business to understand, turning that into something that they can use uh, and getting them to see that sort of longer term view. So, yeah, I chose re regenerative business deliberately um, because it, it's slightly more targeted um, and, and changes, the, changes the mindset a little from a general sustainability um, context to something a bit more direct and purposeful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, it's, that's, you know, we need to change the story, don't we? And the language you use and that framing is, yeah, definitely. is part of that. I don't know if you saw, I'm happy to find the link and post it in the chat. There was a report last week released by Forum for the Future called the Just and Regenerative Business Compass. Um, and I've been having a read of it over the past week or so, and, and I'll find the link in a minute. But that talks about these different mindsets or we need a mindset shift, um, not just about doing less harm, but about enabling life to flourish and that just focusing on just and regeneration. Um, I'll, I'll try and dig a link out and put that in the chat for people that, that might be interested. Um, and their work is all framed around systems change and systems thinking. Um, which I know you mentioned, uh, Rosamond. I was just wondering, maybe you could speak to that a bit around how, you know, how would how would you define sort of systems thinking if if people might not be familiar with that term on the call, um, and why is that why is that important to you? Cool. Sorry, can you um, just repeat the the question for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. I was just talking about systems change and systems thinking, and. How might you describe systems thinking for people that might not be familiar with it? And why is that important to you? Yeah, no, very good, very good question. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, so I think um, I'm actually going to link in Emma talking about climate literacy and Charlie's re regenerative as well into that. Um, if we're exploring systems thinking, it is essentially understanding how everything is in relationship. And I think once um, you start using the word regenerative, you understand how everything is interconnected and, and relational. So one choice here is ultimately going to have a knock on effect elsewhere or um, somewhere else in the interconnected um, system. And it's all based on looking at ecosystems and understanding the natural world as an ecosystem and how all of those are relational and different impacts um, and different influences obviously have a knock on effect. So if um, you have uh, different species arriving, if you have um, different pollutants or, or other impacts um, within an ecosystem, we know that those will ultimately um, have a negative effect, that there'll have to be adaptations, um, <clears throat> that it could um, mean that the whole ecosystem is going to suffer and, and struggle. So it's all about understanding how those different things have to have to balance um, um, and how different energies flow within those systems as, as well to try and kind of explain it as, as simply as possible. Um, and when you're thinking about a regenerative system, 
that means that the energy is thought about at each of those stages so that it's not going to cause an adverse effect um, either at the end of it or part way through um, that uh, resources and the flow of energy is is able to go into more of a cycle so that's where the circular economy idea additionally comes in and connects um, and then thinking about carbon literacy it is genuinely understanding that cycle of, of carbon and how we can mitigate the use of, of a fossil fuel within within that cycle so that we genuinely reduce CO2 um, and that ultimately will enable us to hopefully mitigate um, the, the worst impacts um, of CO2 um, emissions. Um, so yeah, carbon literacy is, is a fundamental way that, that everyone can access an understanding of systems thinking and, and how really significant small changes um, we can do on a personal level, but more importantly, holding larger corporations and, and other uh, businesses accountable for, for making changes to how their systems function um, is vital. I'm quite aware of not um, this kind of push of the individual being responsible for their carbon footprint um, versus actually, you know, exploring um, where the most carbon is uh, materialising from uh, and how we can, um, you know, hold those larger corporations and, and nations potentially accountable uh, for that too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's that shared responsibility, isn't it, and a collective action, hopefully, and that, and that Thank you. And that picks up on um, what Richard mentioned in the chat around um, maybe the slowness of governments to act. Um, and that actually, you know, I might pinch a living systems example around that. You know, businesses can be agile and flexible, you know, just like a starling murmuration flowing through the, the sunset or the sky, you know we can be like that as businesses and, and as in individuals and as systems in ourselves. You know, we can be agile, we can be quick to act, whereas governments are slow machines, if you like. Um, and I think that's where we need to realise our sort of ability to influence change. Um, so that's what I was thinking as, as you were speaking. Um, thanks for the comments coming through. I think we'll try and bring it to a close um, as we as we come to the sort of finish um, and just before we do that I'd love to just pick up on the the point Charlie you mentioned you were part of the the sort of global um, impact platform for number goal 13 uh, climate action I was just wondering sort of can other people be involved in that or do you know are there other impact platforms for the other goals um, that you might be able to join uh, there are quite a few, um, but obviously they, they range in size and they range in sort of output collaboration um, and, you know, actual impact, I suppose. Um, this one for us um, stemmed from some work we, we did, a video we did a little while ago. Um, Deloitte approached us to join, which was lovely um, and quite sort of a reward given the size of our business. Uh, and essentially what it is, is, is providing our input into where we think climate action can be taken. Um, our perspective from our point of view is a, is a very small SME in the region um, and it gives us sort of a, a voice to represent SMEs in the southwest so it's, it's goal 13 impact platform um, I can share the link in the chat anyone is free, uh, free to join up um, it's a very uh, useful platform I think because it, it's it's got a lot of opinion and output on there so everyone that has contributed their output is listed and detailed um, let me just put this into the group. I think I can only send it to you, Chris. So I'll share it with you. Um, cool. But yeah, it's a, it's a really good platform. It's Goal 13 Impact Platform. It's got a lot of perspective from various businesses globally as to what their barriers, um, what their goals, what their challenges are, how they're overcoming them. So you can sort of see the correlation across industries, across sectors, across countries, and across sort of varying business sizes. Um, there's a lot of really useful information on there to. Um, to take on board and sort of adapt your own means. Um, and it's certainly nice from our point of view to see our little business alongside Shell, Fidelity, British Airways, and then those sort of size businesses. So it's, um, yeah, it, it's good fun. And I suppose the other benefit is you can approach any of the other contributors to collaborate. So there's a huge opportunity to advance your networks and capabilities as well. Oh, great That's to hear, thank you. Um, 
yeah, I've just posted that link in the chat and I'm um, to hear a bit more about that as well. Um, I'd love to just go around and hear from, from all of you before we finish um, around sort of maybe just posing the question, you know, if you, if you could change, change one thing um, about uh, what we do or about our systems, um, what would it be and why? Um, would love to just bounce on that as we close. Um, I'll give you a little bit of thinking time um, as as I sort of wrap up. Just to let people know, we we have a Plymouth Social Enterprise Network um, closing event tomorrow. Um, as part of I mentioned, this this event is part of the the Peace and festival this year and um, we have a closing event tomorrow and i think there's still space within that if people are local and would like to come along um, i'll just post the link in the chat uh, but we'd love to hear yeah if if our speakers or panelists would change uh one thing what would it be and why and yeah rosamine would you be able to kick us off Oh, um, I'm not entirely sure. A lot of thoughts were going through my head. Um, I'll try and say, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of social reform and very interesting uh, transformative ideas that I'm a big supporter of. Um, uh, even going as far as like the four day week or universal basic income, you know, that transformative experience of, of how we can live as actual communities, how we can collaborate better within our communities. Um, but I suppose for, for me, if I'm looking specifically within an educational um, perspective, um, I would really like to see um, all children and young people having um, the opportunity to spend more time as nature and being outdoors. I think that's my, my main one, so that we have a relationship with our planet. And that's why we want to work to take care of it. Awesome, thank you. Um, Charlie, what about you? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. What, what do you choose from that? I think Rosalind's kind of made a really good point from, um, you know, again, looking at the environment, being able to get everyone to embrace the environment. We've all had an appreciation for the great outdoors and we've sort of had our allotted time to be able to go out and get into the, uh, the wild, as it were. Um, so having people reconnect with nature is a really cool one. Um, for me, I think to provide something else, um, probably improving the collaboration. I know I've mentioned it already, but um, between local governments and businesses, um, instead of sort of potentially you know, driving their own means and own ends, having collegiate um, sort of sessions together to drive sort of holistic change, you know, joining forces to, to make everything better and seeing the bigger picture is something that I think really needs to happen and I really hope can happen. Um, you sort of see tentative approaches all around the country that people are coming together to do things positively. Um, and I hope that really picks up and certainly for our region with what we have to offer down here is a, is a huge um, potential positive. So I hope that really takes off. Awesome. And yeah, Emma. Thank you. Yeah, great. Two great uh, contributions. Um, I think I'm going to talk about apathy. So I meet a lot of people who um, maybe lack the, um, it's not often the means, actually. It's usually the will or the um, momentum to make changes. So, you know, people will say, well, I would do that, but, I, but you know, I'll never get around to it. Or well, I would, but I don't really know how to stop all that sort of stuff. So I see that so much. And, and when you consider um, what sheep we all are, <laughs> you know, um, we've all managed to get the hang of Amazon pretty quickly. You know, we've all managed to get the hang of having two cars instead of one pretty quickly and all those things. I'm saying we in the sort of general populace. We can get the hang of stuff pretty quickly when we need, we all got the hang of wearing a mask, for example. Um, and yeah, I was one of the people that said to my mum, there's no way we'll all be wearing masks, right? So we can do it, we can change. So I would love the kind of uh, people don't like change thing to go because people change stuff all the time, right? We all move home, we change our clothes every day, we get our hair cut, all that stuff, we can deal with it, right? So therefore, if we 
if we lose that kind of, oh, it's change, change is really hard in one breath. And then we say businesses are really agile in another. If we leave that behind, like change is just how we live. We're, you know, society and every day the weather's different and we just got to get used to it. So if we can get over that thing that change is hard, and then if more people get confident and say, well, I've gone, you know, I don't eat meat as much as I used to. And actually, we're not going to fly this this summer and all the rest of it. I think the kind of uh, sheep mentality um, that we're all part of, we all like to do what our peers do. We're social animals. That, for me, would be, you know, would be great. So it goes from the kind of the green movement being 5% or, you know, 10% if you're lucky to 20 to 30. And then we get to a tipping point where it's just normal. So if I could change one thing, I would remove the thing that changes hard. And I would just say, it's just normal. It's just, that's just what we do now. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And thanks to the other two as well. And thank you for everyone for, for contributing in the chat and, and coming along and spending your, your hour and a half with us. Really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, big thank you from, from me and then Low Carbon Devon. And yeah, really hope to see you soon. And, and continue the conversation and thank you to our speakers again and and to tom to tom burbeck from from art marine as well um let's just do a three second close out so if you could describe the world that you want to live in in three words what would they be and why feel free to contribute in the chat if people are listening and still there um i'm gonna go with flowing compassionate action so th three words from you charlie thanks mate um i think fair open and credible nice and emma charlie said fair i was going to go fair <laughs> ambitious and green Cool. And Rosmond. Um, yeah, great words already. <laughs> Racking my brains. I will go for caring, hopeful, and just. <laughs> cool. What a wonderful way to finish. And thank you for those coming through in the chat as well. Green, fair, sustainable. Love the world. What a great way to finish and consider it sustainable and dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Let's leave it open. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. Um, have a beautiful rest of the evening. And yeah, hope to see everyone soon in person, hopefully. But that's all for now. And yeah, see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.